Good morning, Sylvia. Day three of our adventure, and today we actually start doing some fun stuff. We are in Blue Springs, Missouri, about to go to Independence, Missouri, which is the official start of the Oregon Trail. And we're going to travel the trail through Kansas, up into Nebraska, to a small town called Fairbury. And I don't know how many stops I've got planned for the day, at least 15 or 20. And you don't have to work very hard today. There won't be many miles today, so let's get started. It's a wonderful 50 degrees on this Sunday morning. Got out a little earlier than usual. It's about 7.30 local time. It's gonna be a beautiful day. Sylvia and I made it to the beginning of the Oregon Trail here in Independence, Missouri. So it begins. Now this building was built in 1933 and there's an office where President Harry Truman was the, I guess, the head judge or whatever, chief judge here for a while. And like I said, this building was built in 1933, but it says that it's resting on the foundations that were laid down in 1828. So there would have been a building here back at the start of the Oregon Trail. And the Oregon Trail existed from about 1840 1869 we'll talk about those dates at another point but why did they start from Independence Missouri and the real reason is we're near the Missouri River and the immigrants would ride the steam paddle boat up the river here and then they would buy the provisions to begin uh, their journey they had to begin their journey by about April 15th and there are a couple of reasons for that one, if they left earlier, the rivers would still be overflowing from the spring melt, from the rains and snow. And also they had to wait until the grass began to grow and green up along the trail to feed their, their livestock. The other reason they had to leave around that time is if they waited too late, they would get caught in the snows in the, in the western Rockies, which happened to the Donner Party in 1846. So doing a quick drive by of the courthouse. This side has the monument to the Oregon Trail and right there's a sign for the start of the Oregon Trail. The Santa Fe Trail also originates from here. This place was built in 1844 and it's mentioned in many of the Oregon and California diaries as being a popular campsite and a place where they could purchase food. And the wagons on the trail covered about 12 to 15 miles per day. So this would have taken them one day approximately to get here. It took me about 20 minutes. The family had four slaves that lived with them. I don't know if it's a recreation or original, but this is what they call the slave cabin. Okay, now right here should be, I can't pronounce it some swells from the wagons that came up around this little hill. I think there's another sign up here. Okay, there's a marker here. Let's get off and take a look. Well, that seems to make it official. Okay, according to this marker, all the trails came through here. Well, the, the big three at the time, the Santa Fe, the Oregon, and California Trail. And the swell in front of us here is one of the few known in the greater Kansas City area. And when they say swell, they mean this area in front of me here. I don't know if the GoPro will show you. But it's a, um, kind of looks like an old road. Yeah, seems pretty obvious now. Through there. Pretty neat, a part of history. I love it. As I said before, the soil comes up behind that tree like a little, little gully, worn down by thousands of wagons and people walking, headed for a better life, they hoped. I'm at a place called Minor Park, and as I said before, three trails came through here, the Oregon, California, and the Santa Fe Trail and they would have had to cross the Big Blue River right over there. So the bridge was built in 1859, so before that they had to ford the river 
down here. And then when they crossed the river, they had to come up around this little bank. And there are a couple of swells. Again, the GoPro will not show them. But there's a couple that I can see from here. And there's probably more over there. Because everyone kind of came the same way across the river and up around this, this bank. Get a little better view of the swells. I'm down in one now. So again, over there's the big blue that they had to cross. They came kind of around the hillside or bank and there's a swell there. And then I'm standing in one here. It's pretty obvious uh, that something went through here and that something was tens of thousands of wagons, oxen, mules, and people. Arriving at New Santa Fe, Kansas and Missouri State Line on the left. This is called New Santa Fe, and there's not much left of New Santa Fe except for a cemetery. But at one time, it was a fairly large camping area because it had water and good grazing. And there were uh, several businesses here. A post office, two general stores, an inn, a shoe shop, a drug store, blacksmith, and saloon. And the saloon was the last place that you could buy whiskey before entering Indian Territory. And this is on the state line between Missouri and Kansas. And not far from here, the Santa Fe Trail would break off and head south toward New Mexico and the Oregon Trail would circle around and start heading north to go to the North Platte River. And there's one interesting thing I want to show you. Here's something that's very common in Kansas because there was not much wood to make fence posts so they carved the local limestone into post and used them for their fences. And these two here are just flanking the flagpole, but these are very common in Kansas anyway. I've seen them a lot over the years. And last, there are some wagon, well, not wagon ruts. They say wagon swells. They're kind of faint, but I think that we're looking right over in here. Kind of matches what I've seen a couple of other places here near Kansas City. Yeah, this is definitely definitely it. It looks like it would come in that direction. Uh, to the corner of the fence, there's a, a swell. And run around and going toward the houses. I wasn't sure if I wanted to come here, but I'm glad that I did. It's a peaceful little spot. It's surrounded by housing now. But as someone who gets into genealogy, I always enjoy a good cemetery. This is the Lone Elm Campground in Olathe, Kansas. Now that's the Conestoga wagon that the uh, traders used on the Santa Fe Trail. That was not the wagon used by the immigrants on the Oregon Trail. It was too big, heavy, and expensive, and required too many oxen to pull. I think this wagon could hold three or four tons. I'd have to check that again, but I know the wagon that most of the immigrants used uh, would only hold about a ton, about 2,000 pounds. And so that's why pretty much everyone walked, unless you were an infant or sick, uh, you had to walk because the wagon was loaded with everything that you needed. Everything you needed to live for five months on the trail and then tools that you needed when you got to your destination to start a homestead, build a house, this marker indicates that the Long Elm campground was in use for at least four decades. Used by traders going to and from Santa Fe. The 49ers were the California Gold Rush. Um, there were uh, notables as, such as John Fremont, Kit Carson, Francis Parkman, and the ill-fated 1846 Donner Party were visitors here. Uh, first known as Round Grove. Uh, by the mid-1840s, this campground became known as Lone Elm because the original grove of trees had been reduced to just one huge elm tree. By the end of the 1840s, the Lone Elm tree was gone, used up for firewood. <laughs> anyway, it's a quite peaceful park.
In all of these campgrounds over nice spots, they pretty much have one thing in common. There had to be a source of water, either a spring or a river or a creek. And in the case of the Lone Elm Campground, there's a creek or a river, stream, I don't know what I call it. I think it's called Cedar Creek. Anyway, there is a uh, stream that runs through here. So water was very important. I'm at Gardner Junction, and in this area, they don't know exactly where, but it's close uh, to this spot, is where the Santa Fe Trail separated and went southwest to the New Mexico area, and the Oregon-California Trail headed northwest up toward um, Nebraska and the Platte River. Let's take a look. Well, <laughs> there's, there's not a whole lot to see here, but it's a nice little public park, roadside park, with some markers and I won't read them, go over them. Um, most of the things on the markers I'll be talking about later as I visit various places. But there's some more of these Kansas fence posts. I think they used them just to mark the boundary of the little park here. It's, it's a good place for a quick leg stretch. A couple of interesting illustrations. Here illustrates how I said most people walked. Here's a woman carrying an infant and a couple of children. Uh, you see oxen and mules. Oxen were the preferred animal to pull the wagons. And again, I'll talk about that later. Here's a good illustration of the where the trails separate. Right, right here, the from right here in Gardner, Santa Fe Trail continues that way, but we're going to follow the Oregon Trail north of Topeka on up into Nebraska. And now it's time for Sylvia and I to head north. We need to travel about an hour to get to Topeka. There's really nothing of interest between here and there, so let's hit the road. Well, I don't know, this one might not have been worth it, but I'm, there's 87 acres here as part of this wildlife area. There's a Pioneer Cemetery, and I guess for about 10 years or so, this was a, a village on the Oregon Trail. This is a good road. <laughs> to get here, I traveled on a couple of dirt roads, and I didn't stop to get a picture of the sign because I didn't know if my kickstand would hold up the bike. But it said, minimal maintenance, proceed at your own risk. And there were three or four of those signs, and I almost turned around. But by the time I came to that decision point, I was too far in. It was easier to keep going than to turn around and go back. I never felt like that I was in over my head. I could always turn around. But it was rough, uh, and so I decided to just keep going. That seemed like the easier thing to do. So anyway, this is the park. Let's go over and look at the cemetery. Actually, it's a nice little place. They've got benches. Here's the cemetery. We'll get there in a moment. There's uh, picnic tables, another bench. Uh, there's some trails, marked trails. Again, it's 87 acres. And I think there's another cemetery around the curve. I don't know if it's a Pioneer Cemetery, but this one's pretty interesting. Part of the headstone has been broken away, but, oh, born in 1824, died 1851. So that was definitely during the Oregon Trail days. And look at June 9th. That means they left uh, probably in, in April back in Independence so Sylvia and I are doing a little off-roading again. Actually, this is a very good road, and it's actually called the Oregon Trail Road. And I would imagine it's pretty close to the original trail because I'm here at a crossing. This is just a little roadside park, and it's got a historical marker that we'll look at. Louis, I can't pronounce it, Vo, Vio, V-I-E-U-X, I'll get it wrong, but there was an elm tree here. Let me walk over to the marker. So there's an elm tree here that was already large when the Declaration of Independence was written. And this tree lasted until 1998 when a thoughtless act of vandalism destroyed it. But just imagine if that tree could have talked. Wow. So I'm guessing by looking at the landscape in the picture that the tree was in here somewhere. 
And this crossing is famous for, again, this guy, Louis V-I-E-U-X, Native American and French descent. He put in a toll bridge here in the 1850s and charged a dollar per outfit. And he supplied immigrants with grain and hay. And just across the bridge, which would have been the crossing, there's a cemetery that we're going to go take a look at because there was a huge cholera outbreak, I think in 1849. I'm sure they'll tell me over there. And so this is a fairly famous pioneer cemetery on the Oregon Trail. So let's go over there and take a look. Oh, wow. Look at this. Here's the, the mother died at 27, April 11, 1859, Mary. And then look over here. Her daughters died about a month and a half after that, twin daughters. So they only lived a month and a half. She, no doubt, died in childbirth. Dang. And that appears to have been his second wife. The first one died in April 13, 57. Then the second one died in 59. He lived to be 62 years old and died in 72. One thing I forgot to mention, this crossing is about 13 days from Independence. And I got here one or two o'clock after goofing off a lot this morning. So I traveled in half a day what it took them 13 days to do. And this place is famous because in 1849, a large wagon train camped here on the east side of the creek and was struck by cholera. And about 50 of the immigrants died within a week and they're buried nearby. So I guess this is not the cemetery where they are buried. I don't know if I can locate it here or not, but this is the family cemetery of the guy that uh, made a fortune here, $300 in one day, a dollar per outfit to cross this toll bridge. but. The immigrants knew that they were going to have to pay tolls at different places, and it was a lot easier than trying to ford the creek, a lot safer too. So let's see if I can find that other cemetery. I've never seen before a picnic table that will never rot. It looks like it's made out of girders from a bridge or something. <laughs> that one's going to last. Built by Dean... Fetchter, Fe uh, Fetchter, I can't pronounce that. Anyway, 1979. That's the same guy that built the picnic table up there. Uh, this is going to last. <laughs> Rot Iron Bridge Company, Builders, Canton, Ohio. This is nice. This is nice. This is going to be here long after that man's gone. I don't see any signs for the cholera cemetery, so... I'm just going to carry on. My wife Lori would hate this. She would get off and walk. It's not so bad. This is actually a fairly smooth road to be gravel. It doesn't have the washboard uh, effect. I think I'm in the town of Westmoreland and this appears to be a model of the wagon that the immigrants use. And as you can see, it's not the Conestoga style that everyone thinks about when they think Oregon Trail. This is a much smaller wagon than that one. The wagon cost $85 and the cover costs more than the wagon for some reason. And it also talks about why they use ox instead of mules because mules were a lot more expensive. It says uh, six mules were $600, eight oxen were $200. And then you had to buy the, the harness and one of the, well, a couple of reasons why they liked oxen were they were much cheaper. They could be a food source <laughs> if you got stranded somewhere and needed food. Uh, they could eat about anything, mules or horses. You had to carry grain and there was only so much that you could take in the wagon. But an ox would eat about anything, I guess. They could eat the grasses along the, the trail. And the Indians didn't really care about stealing them where mules and horses they would so pretty much majority of the immigrants had that set up right there went across the country pulled by oxen at a rate of 12 to 15 miles a day wow I stopped here because there's supposed to be a, a grave site here and I see one more marker to my right but this talks about uh, what confirms what I've read, that there are an average of 15 graves for every mile of the trail, something like 10% of the people that left uh, 
for Oregon did not make it. And uh, mostly cholera and accidents and just hard work. There were very few killed by the Indians, and I'll talk more about that at a later time. Let's see if I can find this, this monument. Well, I thought that I was going to walk to the grave site, but apparently not. Looks like a very nice trail, but it's locked. So it looks like the trail goes down under the bridge. That would have been neat, but not today. Oh well. Well, I chickened out on Alcove Spring. I really wanted to go, but there's two more miles of this gravel road, and I think it's been graded recently, and there's a lot of loose gravel. Uh, this road here doesn't look bad, but down where I just turned around, it was getting worse. And there's a storm that might be headed my way, so I certainly don't want to get down three or four miles down a gravel road with lots of loose gravel and plowed up dirt. I didn't get caught in a rainstorm. That's more adventure than I'm looking for, so Alcove Spring will just have to remain unvisited unless I'm out here someday in, a, in my truck. 